Right. Okay. So welcome to Biblical Preaching. Uh, okay. This class is shrunk. <laughs> In-person class, online students. I think Anand is uh, connecting. Okay. Okay. Right. So online students also, I think it's uh, only Nina and Shivakumar. Okay. Right. Okay. Welcome back. Um, so this course, uh, we're going to look at... Um, um, like uh, the course uh, homiletics, which means preaching. So we're going to look at biblical preaching and all that entails um, a biblical preaching. So um, what do you think? Are all of us called to preach or only some of us? The gospel you're all to preach. Yes, uh, that is very uh, that is very true. All of us are called to preach the gospel. Uh, so preach, what does preach mean? To tell others, okay. Um, share. Share is a very nice Christian term, right? Share. <laughs> when you share your testimony, what does preach mean? Really? Teach. See, the thing is, um, teaching and preaching are two different things. Yeah. So what does um, so what does preach mean? To speak out, yeah, kind of close. So to huh? to address, to speak out, <laughs> to to proclaim rather, right? To proclaim, to announce, right? So that is preaching, right? To declare, to proclaim, to announce. So you know, so why why are we looking at one full semester about preaching? Because uh, we see it in the Word of God, right? We see that um, if you want to use another word, another term, you know, we all of us are called to communicate the gospel, right? All of us are called to communicate the gospel, gospel, and some are called into the you know fivefold ministry, which involves a lot of that, right? Maybe an evangelist, which which involves a lot of proclamation of the gospel, company with signs, wonders, miracles, and so on, right? So uh, we're taking time to look at, you know, what is this uh, proclamation? What is this preaching involved, etc. So it, it, it involves a, a bit of theory and also some practical things, right? You know, some of the theory in the sense, some of the spiritual truths or spiritual backing of it, and also some of the practical elements of communication of it you know when we speak uh, to be good communicators to to make sure that there is no barrier right um, to uh, to communication and so on so we're going to look at that so for this course um, grading we have two quizzes right uh, at the intervals and that's it um, so those will be used okay so even before we look at preaching, you know, we see that uh, what do we preach from? We preach from the Word of God. We preach from the Bible. Okay, and we see that the Bible, uh, though it is a you know simple message right through, it is a complex word. It's a complex book, right? Because it was written across centuries, like thousands of years, by many authors. But we know that there was one uh, main author directing the entire message, but it's one big message right through. And we have several people who wrote across different time frames, right? And we know that the Bible speaks to us today. It's so relevant today when we, you know, when we open and we read and, and that's because the Holy Spirit speaks to us, quickens the word to us. But the way we understand it and the way the people of those times understand or understood it, there could be a difference. Right? There could be a difference because of our... And why is that? Why could there be a difference in the way we understand? Or... Hmm. Yeah, the, so the, yeah the, the, the language itself plays a big role, right? At language, the culture, culture meaning you know, the, the way things were done, some traditions, etc. Right. So, so even before we get into preaching, the thing is to understand, 
right? And that is why uh, I think last semester you had hermeneutics. Was it last semester, right? Hermeneutics, interpreting, understanding. So even before we begin to proclaim or communicate um, the way we understand, the way we rightly divide the word is very, very important, right? So uh, that's why Paul writes to Timothy and he says, you know, rightly divide the word of God, right? Because um, like, we, we, like we've been seeing, you know, when we get a revelation or when we understand a certain concept or truth, it changes us, right? Because we, we are convicted or we, we have a conviction about a particular truth. And when we are convicted or when we have this conviction, then we begin to live life according to that conviction. Okay, We believe that it is to be true and we are convicted in our hearts and we live according to it. So the way we live depends on what conviction or what revelation we receive. Okay, So it's, it's going to change the way the whole thing about our perspective, the way we live our lives, everything changes. Okay, So what we understand, the revelation that we get is very important. Okay, So the whole thing, if you, if you want to look at a flow, it, it's, it's like revelation, conviction, and uh, action. Right? And then it changes our destiny or destination. So revelation, conviction, action, and you can say destiny. Right? So it's important to understand. Okay? So let's look at, uh, of, uh, you know, just brush up our hermeneutics. Okay? So firstly, uh, you know, when we interpret the word of God, we interpret it according to, like how we do any language. We interpret it according to the grammar. Okay? So how it's constructed, we interpret it grammatically, so which means the way the language is written, okay, the way the language is, what it means when you read, how, what is what is it, what are certain words, what meaning do they convey, right? So interpret it grammatically. Okay, so when we look at uh, grammatical interpretation, uh, we also think about. You, know, you can look into your notes. Um, I'm just looking at the first chapter. Interpreting grammatically. So what, what are the normal everyday words or phrases that are used in the text? Okay. What is the meaning of it? Okay. So our interpretation of these words must be same as the way it was written or the way it was conveyed. Okay. So somebody if, if somebody says um, you know good morning and uh, you know, that word morning has a meaning for us. It means daylight. It means, okay, there is sunrise. But what if that word meant something else than they said? You know, just think about, think about it, right? What if it meant evening or what if it meant darkness, right? So then the meaning that we assign or the interpretation that we get from it is totally different, very, very different, right? So, so we need to understand, okay, is the word that I use, the, the grammar or the meaning of the words that we use, is it the same as what it was, what it was meant? Okay, like for example, the third hour of the day, right? We see that on right third hour. What does third hour mean? Right? And how do they see it? Right? In the book of Acts, it says, like Peter says, right? Uh, it's it's only the third hour. And these are not drunk as you suppose. So third hour actually meant it's not three, three o'clock, but it's actually nine o'clock. So first hour, they would start from 6 a.m. So it's actually 9 a.m. So he, what he was saying was, hey, it's only 9 a.m. right? But if uh, in our understanding, third hour meant, okay, 3 a.m., then the way we understand the text would be totally different. Okay? So, so it, it helps okay, to understand what, is it, um, what does it mean? What do the words mean? What do the phrases mean? Um, what do the sentences mean? And so on. Okay, so grammatically interpreting it grammatically. So most of the Bible is it is easily interpreted by taking the meaning of the language, either in the original or in the translation. Okay. For example, John chapter 3, verse 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Okay, so we we read it. And it's it's very clear. There's no hidden meaning, right? We understand it, and it makes sense. Okay. In other words, Acts chapter one, verse eleven. Okay. Um, these are the words of the angels, right? Uh, 
So angelic beings who are talking to the disciples and say, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So again, uh, it makes perfect sense. There's no hidden meaning or agenda. What they're saying that, okay, you saw him come and you saw him go. So in, in the way, the manner in which you saw him go, he will come again. It's talking about the second coming. So there will be a physical, you know, uh, yeah, coming back to on to the earth. So it's very clear. So um, so it makes sense, right? Now, when we read a literal text, now this is very literal. The way you saw him go, he will come back again. Okay, so we see it, we read it, we understand it. Now. Let's look at uh, certain uh, passages where the there there are symbols or it is symbolic. Okay, so if you a, a classic one is Revelation chapter one. Okay, Revelation one, and uh, you can read from verse nine onwards. Right. Um, and particularly, um, yeah, we, maybe we can look at verse 13. Okay, And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment, came to the feet, came down to the feet and girded about, uh, and a garment which came down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire, and so on. You know, it describes uh, the Son of Man, describes Jesus. And, uh, and it goes on to talk about um, what is actually symbolic in this whole thing, right? Talks about seven lampstands, talks about uh, the, the, uh, yeah, uh, the stars, and so on, right? So it says, says here in verse 20, um, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Okay, So we see that it is a symbolic thing. You know, We see that, okay, this is what John saw and this is what the Lord was saying. But it actually was pointing to something else. Okay, It was not a literal thing, but it was symbolic. Okay. So similarly, we will see, we need to understand what is symbolic in Scripture. And what is it pointing to? You know, Is there any explanation in Scripture itself? You see here, Scripture itself uh, is assigning the symbols and there is a, you know interpretation or the explanation of what these symbols actually represent. The stars, the golden lampstands and so on. Okay. So similarly, we need to actually see, you know, is, is it symbolic or is it literal? Okay? Because if it is symbolic and if you're going to be preaching it as something that is literal, then there's going to be a problem, right? Okay. Um, so um, the second one, uh, first is interpreting grammatically. The second one to the second uh, rule or guideline that we can use to interpret is to interpret historically. You know, rather than ask the, asking the question, okay, what does it mean to me? Of course, that's a very important question because uh, you know we read the word and then God is speaking to us, uh, so we need to ask that question. Okay, what is this truth? How does it apply to me, etc.? What is God speaking to me right now? But the important question again is to ask, you know, what did it mean to the original listener? or to whom it was, of course, the word of God is for us as well. But when it was spoken to them, when it was given to them, um, what was that? What was, what was it intended to convey? Okay, what does it mean to them? Okay. Um, so we are talking about a different culture. We are talking about a different um, traditions, etc. So it's good to ask that question, you know. Was there anything different in the way it, you know, it is addressed? To those people, right? Is is there anything in particular that? Um, uh, so then, when we understand that, uh, we get a clearer, you know, understanding of okay. Even if I yeah, it does apply to me, but even when it 
means I need to apply it and take it. No, this is the original meaning. Okay, this is how it was meant. So I don't have to misapply it in my life. It becomes clearer. Now it doesn't mean that I don't have to apply it, but I don't have to. I don't. I should not apply it. But when I apply it, it becomes clearer. Okay. Um, okay. For example, Genesis fifteen seven to twenty one. We know, right? The Lord actually cut a covenant. Okay. So cutting a covenant. What did it mean then? You know, we know that literally it meant cutting off the animals and the birds and the Lord going in the middle. So, so hence the term cutting a covenant. Okay, so we, we understand that, that it was literally two people going through what, you know, the the animals or the birds which are split and kept and then going through. So that is the whole term cutting the covenant, right? So uh, you know that it is more than a contract. It is, uh, you know, it is something which is very solemn, something that was done, uh, meaning that both parties would keep up and so on. So that is what covenant means. Okay. Um, another uh, one, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, right? 1 Corinthians 11, 4. Okay, so let's uh, look at that. Okay, 11 and verse 4. Um, every, uh, this, this is about the head covering, right? Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered, dishonors her head. And that is one and same as if her head were shape okay so what did it mean then right to have a, a woman who was who was walking around with a head shape okay so that in that time right the the priestess of aphrodite the temple prostitutes they had shaven heads right so that is that is how uh, that is uh, that was that is how they recognized or identified themselves. Okay, so it is not that you know somebody who's who shaved their head that you know they are uh, uh, Paul is actually looking down or dishonoring and you know at that time this is how it was. So they identified themselves. So he's he's saying that you know it, it is as if one is actually identifying with them, right? So, so we, when, once we understand that, then we then we know that okay, uh, it's okay to cut hair, you know, for a for a lady to have a short hair, right, or to have a very short haircut, it's it's fine, right. But in those times, it meant that they identified with this group of people or these um, temple priestess prostitutes who were there. So, so we understand that. Okay, so when we look at historically, then this whole thing changes. Okay, now if I take the take this text and say, you know, and preach on a Sunday message, you know, if you're cutting your hair, you know, you are you're bringing dishonor upon yourself. You know, you're bringing you're bringing dishonor upon yourself. You're bringing dishonor to this church, and and there are people who do that, right? So so that's the thing. So it becomes very legalistic, very uh, you know, and and not really God honoring. Right. So, so it changes. So once we know the historical perspective, it changes. It changes the way we uh, we we the way the the revelation we receive. Yeah, there's a perspective, and the way we apply it in our lives and the way we would minister the word, right? That changes. Right? So this helps. Okay. So interpreting it historically. And uh, of course, we can use other tools like the Bible dictionaries and etc. Um, to discover customs, um, the places, and so on. Okay. And third one is to interpret critically. To cr critical means that you you look at no, does it uh, hold reason? Okay, does it hold to reason, or is it you know, am I putting in some bias there? When I'm reading into it, right? am I looking at it in a biased manner? Am I bringing my own prejudice into it, or does it stand to reason? Okay, that is 
when you look at critical thinking that's what it is so when we interpret it critically you know is there any uh, you know are we contradicting it are we bringing some prejudice into it does it make sense rationally okay um, so that is another way of uh, another guideline to use in order to interpret scripture okay so let's look at uh, six practical rules or six guidelines to help us with uh, sound interpretation okay now in all this you know we're not saying that we will rule out uh, or take out you know the work of the holy spirit you know in all this we we partner with the holy spirit or uh, you know we we depend heavily on the holy spirit's guidance to you know to lead us to interpret scripture right so it's not devoid of that okay okay so interpreting in the light of the context of the passage okay now what does it mean when you say context the situation okay somebody is saying something what is the situation what is the background the reason okay so what is the bigger picture right what is the what is the surrounding what is the circumstance uh, what is the bigger picture right because we can take a text right when we say we can take a text and then we can take a verse and we can completely miss out the context like the background background with which it is said like for example um i think it's in uh, um first timothy uh titus anyway i i think it's uh there's an old testament reference which people use um you know uh, is there a ref verse where you know to the pure all things are pure um is it in titus or sorry uh okay yeah yeah to paint to the pure all things are pure but to to those who are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure even their mind and conscience are defiled okay so here he paul is actually talking about those who are insubordinate those who are you know idle talkers and so on so he's actually exhorting titus and he's saying you know, titus you know this is the this is what you need to do etc now there was there were a group of people okay um um who actually took this verse and said okay we are the righteousness of god in christ okay we have been cleansed we've been washed by the blood of jesus and we are we have been made pure so because we are pure to the pure all things are pure okay they just took that verse and this actually was a cult okay so so for them it was like this so no matter what i do because i am pure everything that i do everything that proceeds from me is pure okay so speech action everything is pure so god sees me as pure so when i whatever i do it is pure right it went terribly wrong because they they indulged in certain things certain acts of the flesh um in fact their whole method of evangelism was to tempt people you know the, the women would go to the bars and they saying and tempt people and then bring them into the cult literally seduce them but their reasoning was this to the pure all things were all things are pure okay that was their only line of reasoning hey just look at the big picture the person to them you know it was joining the cult the person is actually coming to the saving knowledge okay so even if i tell them a lie here and there what is the bigger picture they are coming to join this you know join this group join this church whatever so it's fine to the pure all things but you look at the other part of it right to those who are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure even their mind and conscience are defiled right 
the mind, the conscious, everything is. And then it talks about you know how they profess to know God and works they deny Him, right? So it actually was referring back to them. In works they deny Him. Are the works pointing to it? No. Right? So when we take a verse uh, out of context, then it becomes a, a, a huge problem. Right? It can, and that's how you know cults and certain heresies are born. And and the thing is, um, you know, we need to understand that thoughts have consequences, ideas have consequences, right? Um, and uh, be, behind every lie, you no, know, it's it's a thought or an idea which is energized by the deceiver. Right? We, we know that Satan is called the father of lies, right? The source or the one who actually propagates lies. Right? So those who are deceived sometimes, or most times, do not understand, do not even realize that they are being deceived and deceiving others. That's the sad part of it, right? So um, yeah, so when we take things out of context, you know, it, it has consequences and sometimes very disastrous consequences. So we we get to, you know, put it in our practice. Okay, what is the context? You know, it, it, it sounds nice, it looks nice, oh it's fantastic. I think maybe I should just preach it, you know, like this, but then look at the context. Okay. Um another verse I think is uh, we can look at Isaiah. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, Isaiah fifty-five. Okay, Isaiah fifty-five verse eight. Excuse me. So, Isaiah fifty-five verse eight. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay. So, yeah, just tell me, um, what is the, what do you understand from this verse? <laughs> Anyone? Hmm. Doesn't. So what I think doesn't match with what God thinks. <laughs> it's 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 never ever going to make sense, right? In the sense, it's never ever going to match. Right? I might think something. Okay, you know, maybe uh, this person has a need, and I need to do something to, you know, I need to bring Christ. I need to, you know, whatever that need is. So does that mean that it's totally opposite of God's thoughts or God's ways? No, right? So no. Sometimes, maybe, yeah, sometimes, yes, possible. But the fact is this, you know, when we look at the verses preceding that, so this is what uh, it says, uh, verse 6, you know, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So, what is the you know what is the person refer, being referred to? Who is being referred to here? The the wicked, okay, or the unrighteous? Okay, he's saying, let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. So he's talking about ways. He's talking about thoughts. He's talking about a lifestyle or a you know action. Talking about thoughts, imaginations. Okay, so let the wicked forsake, let the unrighteous. And in the same way, the Lord, what the Lord is the Lord saying, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the wicked, he's talking to the unrighteous. You know, if you're unrighteous, hey, you need to change your ways. If you're, you know, if you're uh, sorry, if you're wicked, you need to change your ways. If you're unrighteous, you need to forsake your thoughts. And the Lord is saying, hey, to the wicked, to the unrighteous, he's saying, for my ways are very different. My thoughts are very different from your thoughts because your ways are unrighteous. Your, uh, your ways are wicked and your thoughts are unrighteous. Mm. Example is 
like we limit ourselves and then it can be matching to yeah we can yeah. okay uh, ravali has a um yeah so the same scripture uh, where on right yeah my for my thoughts are not your thoughts and neither my ways are not your ways but the preceding is as the heavens are higher than the earth so are my ways are higher than your ways and your thoughts yeah in the context of um, if we as a humans are very limiting ourselves to a certain thing okay i can only do this much i will only get this much uh, for a certain thing uh, does this apply in that context where god says you know uh, you are only limiting yourself your ways and your thoughts about this certain area in this way but i have you know i think more greater for you like mm. i uh, you know my ways for you are greater there are a lot of yeah. good things you know greater things are ahead yeah. of so uh, ephesians 320 you know talks about that right now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above that all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church mm -hmm. right so above all that we ask i'm asking for one thing the lord is saying hey i'm going to do 10 mm. above all that we ask above all that we think the lord is able to do so this can be applied in that context can be well. so so the thing is the way it is what is the context of this original text it is this mm. okay so every time you know we there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong in saying okay god's thoughts are higher but if i'm going to you know if i'm going to put myself down or if i'm going to put others down and or if i'm going to say you know if i you know the way we apply it we say i don't know what god wants you know that's the ultimate conclusion right uh, it brings us to a place of um fuzziness non clarity about certain things and saying you know there's no conviction from this is what you know i i prayed i've asked this is i see the principles here i see the leading of the holy spirit but my thoughts are you know his thoughts are always i so i don't know what you know if it brings us to that place if the application of the truth then 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 that is not the way it is intended right but we can definitely look at it in the con in the way of efficiency 320 where it says hey i'm seeking him i'm asking but he's able to do more than that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you you'll see the difference the first one is a place of you know non clarity and negativity the second one is a place of faith you say hey this is what i'm believing god for this is what i'm asking god but he's able to do much more right so that's the thing um okay um yeah god's thoughts thoughts are superior thank you ashok uh, ma yeah okay right so um, so looking at the context yeah you know happens right so maybe you're praying for someone and this is what is quickened right that his thoughts are greater higher yeah, yeah. um see what what i'm just saying that um, you know the normally when it is the way it is applied is you know i want to do something or uh, you know it, it it's in a place of uh confusion normally the application is i don't know what god wants i don't know what his ways are it's it's in a place of confusion and lack of clarity and i'm not saying that you know we will have 100% clarity in everything right <laughs> that is also not what i'm saying but but the thing is the way it is applied is this you know this is what i'm thinking but i don't know what god's ways are this is what i'm doing but i don't know his ways are higher his ways are thoughts are higher greater you know we kind of it we kind of say that no matter what as a believer no matter what i'm doing his ways are going to be different his thoughts are going to be different right 
so that is what we say you know this is what i'm doing but god is doing something else and his ways are different well you know they that are led by the spirit of god they are the sons and daughters of god sons of god right we are called to be led we are called to hear the voice of the shepherd right? and we and this verse is actually uh, you know rather than bring people to a place of saying hey i can hear i've been designed to hear god i've been designed god speaks to me and i i'm, I'm called into that intimate fellowship rather than bringing people to that it's kind of you know always alienates right so so that was the intention right okay right so interpreting in the context so what would help us some questions like okay what testament is this is it new testament old testament who's the author what's the time period uh, is it uh, before the cross after the cross etc that's the second thing okay interpret in the light of progressive revelation Okay, interpret in the light of progressive revelation. Let's look at Hebrews. Uh, I think this Hebrews 1 throws light on that. Okay, God who at, who at various times, God, uh, sorry, Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2, right? God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the well, so we know that God has been, God is a speaking God. He has been speaking right from the beginning. He has been, you know, through the prophets and through his, uh, whom he has appointed, he has been speaking, he has been directing. And we have the revelation of the truth unfolding right through the time periods, right through scripture. Okay, it's very clear. Uh, but we also need to know the, you know, that revelation has been progressive. Okay. Um, we see certain places that we, we see those shadows of the cross. We see that things were done in pointing to the cross. Right? And um, so we see that uh, outworking of that or the unfolding of that. Okay? So we need to understand that. Right? So people were looking towards the cross and we are in the dispensation looking at something that has already been done. Okay? So especially when it comes to study of characters, like character study, okay, we need to mention, we need to be careful. Okay, hey, this was in, uh, that doesn't mean we don't have, we will, we will not be able to glean some important truth. Okay, how did this person live? How did this per person relate to God? What are some of the, you know, good things that they did? What are some of the, you know, limitations they had? You know, all those, all those things we learn, right? When we study, but we another important factor is in which time frame or period in the dispensation did they live? Okay, and it makes a big difference, right? Yes or no? In what way? In what way does it make a difference? One basic thing. So, so, tell me again. Sorry. When we look at the time frame and lived in the period, correct. Yeah, uh, but in the light of uh, true, okay, maybe they are living at. Uh, so when you're saying what what changed, so what is it that changed? Covenants. Yeah, okay, different covenant. The way it related God related to them. Uh, yeah, in that dispensation. No, the 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 the. I'm some. I'm sure there are many things, but. One basic thing is the way God um, moved or ministered among them with the work of the Holy Spirit, right? So God would come upon a person or a group for an assignment, for a purpose, and they would finish, and then God would move on, you know, rise, raise up another person, 
a, a spokesperson. We, we see that. And we see that. And we see the, you know, in the cross or up, uh, after the cross, uh, on this side of the cross, we see the, the work of the Holy Spirit indwelling each and every person. So the way these people related to God, or the common people related to God, and the way we now can relate to God is very different. Yeah, because uh, the kings would go and say, okay, I want to hear from God, call the prophet. Let's go to the seer, right? Let's go. Let's go meet them. And there was nothing wrong. right? But if I'm going to be heavily dependent on the prophet or the seer today as a child of God, then there is something. You know, that's, It's going to be uh, my spiritual life. Uh, it's not going to be wholesome. It's going to be prone for errors. I'm going to be opening my life up. So, so that's the thing. right? So we need to be, we need to understand that, hey, these people related, uh, especially when you, when you talk about the prophetic ministry and so on, the work of the gifts and so on, we understand, okay, this is the time frame they lived in. This is the dispensation they lived in. So it's very, very important for us to uh, understand that. Okay, apart from that, okay, we see that, uh, you know, polygamy. Okay, polygamy was uh, in, in the Old Testament. Okay, we see that. What is polygamy? more than one spouse or more than one wife actually right uh, i think it works both ways but anyway and so in the old testament we see that they had multiple wives right so it was there so can i carry forward same thing right so we see that it was it it was never condoned or you know saying that this is what you must do in the old testament but very clearly, we see the uh, progressive revelation in the old, in the New Testament, about um, uh, you know about uh, uh, about marriage, about uh, uh, you know taking on multiple wives and all that. So, so it's very clear. Okay, so there are there have been groups of people who again did the same thing. You know, it was there in the Old Testament, so I can do the same thing now in the New Testament. For example, Mormons, you know, uh, uh, the Mormon, the, the, it is, it is allowed. It is okay. Right. So, so they, the Church of the Latter Day Saints, right? So polygamy is, yeah, taught and practiced. You have a question. I have a question. Yeah. So, when coming to this progressive revelation, mm. uh, when we are taking example of this polygamy, what is the, you know, uh, the answer we are backing up with. So we are saying uh, God is ministering to us in different type, you know, different uh, age there in a different way. But now when coming to the progressing to the New Testament and New Age right now, it's different. Different? Okay. In what way is it different? Uh, in what way sometimes, uh, for example, this polygamy that time it was allowed. Yeah. It, but, was, it was never... It was, it was never. permitted, but it was never condoned. Uh -huh. Never condoned. Yes, it was permitted, but it was not uh, considered as a sin as well. Right. Okay. It was not considered as a sin as well. Because even the great heroes of faith, they have multiple wives, right. which we look up to right now. Mm -hmm. So now it is a sin. It is a sin that you can't uh, marry more than one spouse mm -hmm. you know under the legal terms of it but how do we back it up like you know when somebody asks us this question yeah we if we say god is ministering in different ways in different uh, yeah. ages and so, times it will yeah. not uh, it will not it will not hold answer. water because uh, it will not be correct correct because god's moral laws never change huh. right uh, the god's moral law which means his nature never changes it doesn't mean that God was unholy. Now he's progressively becoming holy. Yeah, Correct, yeah, no? that's that's the reason. That's the thing. Okay. So how do we justify this? Justify and the, this and, and that. the other things. Okay. Shall we look at it next class? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, online students also, um, you can actually uh, just think about this this particular question which Ravali asked, right? So, um, 
yeah god's intention for man has always been monogamy yes uh, nina so uh, we, we understand that so what we'll do is uh, we'll, we'll back it up with scripture you know look into god's word uh, and then we'll share from god's word how um, god's view of marriage has never changed because the way he created and the way you know he brought eve to adam and so on so uh, his view of we know we understand that so let's uh, look at scripture let's come back with some scripture yeah next class and uh, we'll share that okay so we'll wind up now thank you god bless bye, -bye.